it. I can believe I can believe I can trick myself into having fun with this. I I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people are playing base rogue and they're doing cool pirate things and it has nothing to do with the subclass. <laughs> yeah. Hello, friend. Robert Pepin here, author of the Caverns of Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels and short stories. With me is Sam West. And today is another Marshall Monday in which we will be discussing the rogue subclass, Swashbuckler. Oh, I'm a pirate, and I've got a pirate bandana, and I sail the seven seas, and I'm historically wildly inaccurate. This is an option that this exists. This is D&D. This is D&D. That's a good point. Um, man, Swashbuckler, it's one of those rogue subclasses where it's like, man, a lot of people get trapped into playing this because it's, you know, the pirate option. That's I could sweet. see me getting trapped into playing this, and that's after reading it. Uh, yeah, it's not great. Um, no, but uh, I don't, there are some fun think, things though. I don't think it's the worst of the bunch, but that's well, like, no, you know, we're done. comparing it to the, intuitive the, and mastermind. Yeah, we're comparing this to the biggest steaming piles of turds the game has to offer. So it's not <laughs> like a particularly high bar. I still don't think I'd recommend most people play this. No, I dive in? probably wouldn't recommend it, but I might play it. Great. What if you just called any rogue you made a swashbuckler? Would that no, I'm not. Problems? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about for the actual features. Oh, okay. Well, we'll talk about it. Uh, so third level, you get fancy footwork and rockish audacity. Uh, rakish audacity. Apologies. Yeah. Uh, whenever you fancy footwork is whenever you choose our tip at third level, you learn how to land a strike and then slip away without reprisal during your turn. If you make a melee attack against a creature, that creature can't make opportunity attacks against you for the rest of your turn. Okie dokie. So you got our, you already had a bonus action disengage right there, but now you can <laughs> dash two, I guess. So yeah, that this we'll get to it when I finish Rakish Audacity. So yeah, Rakish yeah. Audacity is starting at third level, you're confident. Your confidence propels you into battle. You can give yourself a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your charisma modifier. Neat. You get an additional way to use your sneak attack. You don't need advantage on the attack roll if you use your sneak attack against a creature. If you're within five feet of it, no other creatures are within five feet of it, and you don't have disadvantage on the attack roll. All their sneak attack rolls, all other rules for sneak attacks still apply to you, which means it has to be a finesse weapon, basically. Okay. Uh, but we can double check. I'll pull it up. I'll consult it while we talk. But um, these two just don't amount to actually a feature. Well, they just see. don't. Uh, <laughs> this, this is uh, yeah. This maybe I could, I would get trapped. But let's see how we could use this. Um, I guess if you are dueling mano a mano, then uh, and you don't have another way to get sneak attack, then uh, Rakesh Audacity could give you something. Is that ever a place a rogue wants to be? No, not not really. Are you fighting in a vacuum without a rest of a party? Well, that's, I mean, that's another thing, though. <laughs> if if there's people within five feet of you, okay, well, I want to use my rakish audacity, so I will stab at this guy and then run over to a, a guy that's all by himself and go fight him. You're allowed to do that. Yes. That is a thing you're allowed to do. Tactically... Killing the one thing will reduce the enemy's actions faster. And then oh, your fighter and you can tag team the other guy. And then your team wins because you didn't waste your time dealing <laughs> damage to a target for that you weren't intending to follow up on and then abandon that target for somebody else. Right? Yeah, I get that. What I'm talking about is not optimal. Oh, but like, just as, as an option? Okay, I'll give you an alternate option. Um, You don't ever run up next to the thing or if you have to run up next to the thing, you just disengage as a bonus action. You weren't using your bonus action anyway. That's because true. you, you weren't steady action. aiming. Mm -hmm. This exclusively works with rapier rogues, right? That's what this option is designed for. Right. So you can just have that option already with cunning action. You can just disengage and then fancy footwork doesn't need to exist. Yeah, but then, but this way you get to attack it. But you then aren't attacking the part target you're going in to get your rock shot SD against. I know, but you're attacking this guy. But the point, if we're not playing You're attacking optimally, this guy now, so you can run away and use your rakish audacity later on your next turn. You just ran away, used your rakish audacity immediately, the way you'd like to. 
If you want to do the duelist yeah, fantasy, okay. you're not even getting fancy footwork. You can already just do that. Okay, now I see what you're saying. And you make a good point here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I got it. On top of that, like, there isn't a real compelling reason still to, like, to do... There isn't a reward, I should say, for doing this, right? The reward for doing this is being allowed to function with your sneak attack. If I'm yeah. paying you off, you're not doing bonus sneak attack damage for soloing somebody, you don't have an interesting decision to make. You just have to opt, actually decide, do I want to get my regular normal free sneak attack by doing the regular rogue thing, or do I want to get a now different sneak attack that doesn't have any strategic advantage, that has no payoff, Okay. in Wait some encounters with Rage Audacity? Okay. Now, if you have people within five feet of you, the odds are pretty good that you'll be able to sneak attack anyway. Yeah. Okay. Now, all right. Now I'm I'm, I'm seeing this for. I'm, the I'm seeing behind the curtain. Yes. Yeah. This is why it traps people because yeah. it's like, oh, you'll get a guaranteed free sneak attack. That's not a problem most of the time. That's not a problem for any amount of coordinated parties. Even on melee rogues, you can run up, ready in action for your fighter to engage, and then still get your sneak attack. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm a little more down on it now. We literally but, uh, are starting with a vacuum for a third level beach. All right, let's move on. Well, we didn't mention we probably oh. should charisma mondo initiative. You rate it probably higher than I would. Oh yeah, forgot about that. All right, I do it's... I do rate that higher than you do. All right, especially. All right, you win initiative. You run up to the first guy, and rakish audacity. What? Plus two or plus three? I would not call winning initiative, but okay. In the event that you, and also you know, you're rogue. You've got a high dex. Sure. You're adding your charisma to that. That's great. Okay. In the event that you can win initiative, then uh, yeah, you. If this is the way you want to play, and this is not how I typically play rogues, I don't want to run up in people's faces. But hey, I'm a swashbuckler. This is what I do. I can run up to the first guy. Nobody else is around. The world is my oyster. Stab, stab, sneak attack. So it's just, it's just funny because like the moment any other of that per party's friends decide to come over and help <laughs> their buddy, you're screwed again because Regish Audacity requires them be alone. If there's two packs of two, you're out of luck. Uh, I'm screwed anyway because I'm a rogue engaged in melee combat. With like no bonus to your defense whatsoever here. I don't... Yeah. yeah. This, if there's a lot of text for what will amount to non features, and Rogue is again one of those weird classes where they have high initiative, but they often want to go later. So, like, there's a lot of problems with that. But Ash is a feature you get at ninth level. So, ninth level, your charm becomes extraordinarily beguiling. As an action, you can make a charisma persuasion check and testify a creature's wisdom insight check. The creature must be able to hear you, and the two of you must share a language. If you see it on the check and the creature is hostile to you, it has disadvantage on attack rolls against targets other than you and can't make an opportunity to attack against the targets other than you. The effect lasts for one minute, or until one of your companions attacks the target or affects it with a spell, or until you leave the target, you and the target are more than 60 feet apart. If you succeed on the check and the creature isn't hostile to you, it is charmed by you for a minute. While charmed regards you as a friendly acquaintance, this effect ends immediately if you or your companions do anything harmful to it. Okay, now this what is the this one... Of? What does this remind you of? What are... Was God, it Compel Duel? Yeah, that's right. Um... Yes, this is the one where I thought this is the trash feature because I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with it. Now, out of combat, uh, if it's not hostile, okay, I can charm a creature for a minute. That's not amazing. You can do that whenever but you I, want, though. Yeah, this yeah. It's kind of like infinite charm persons if for an out of combat situation. Yeah, that's true. But I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do with this like in combat because it feels like it doesn't specifically say combat. It says they're hostile to you. Um, it feels like it's supposed to be a combat feature, but it ends if any combat actually takes place. So the effects are notably different, right? So there, it checks if it's hostile to you or if it isn't. So if it's hostile to you, you get the it is it managed on attack rolls text and all of that. That includes the, the ending text, right? So it doesn't end if you attack a creature hostile to you. If the creature is hostile to you, the only thing yeah. that ends is the charm and the charm doesn't occur at all. If the creature is hostile to you. So it's a one ability. If they're hostile, one ability, if they're not, and the end conditions are different. Well, no, I mean, but 
the first effect ends if one of your companions attacks the target. Yeah. Which is a bummer. Okay. Yes. The idea is you're supposed to be the duelist here, right? The idea is All you right, lock down okay. one person and you say, I'm going to be just fighting you. And once again, okay. then gives you exactly zero payoff for doing so. Because you run in and go, I expect you to mono mono me. And they go, okay, okay. do you get yeah. like plus to hit or plus to damage or higher AC or any other? Nope. You just can't attack Wait. my friends unless they attack you. That's, yeah, that's nothing. Yeah, it's baffling. That's also what Compelled Duel does, fun fact. But um, this <laughs> is... Uh... Yeah, but Compelled Duel, I'm thinking, you know, like, is that is that castable on other people? Or, or wait, how does that work? Compelled Duel is you attempt to compel a creature to into a duel. One creature you can see makes the whiz save, where it would replace the insight versus persuasion. Uh, it's drawn to you, compelled for the demand. It has disadvantage tackles on anything other than you, just like Panache does. Yeah. Um, it makes, uh, it can't, it makes a wisdom saving throw tries to move further away. So the other thing that you like is that it kind of locks it near you. Yeah, um, and also I was thinking for, like for a paladin or somebody tough, okay, maybe you want to be taking a bunch of hits. It doesn't even force wanna... them to, though, remember. Yeah, yeah. And neither does this. No, but uh, I mean, as a swashbuckler, I guess I want to be engaged in duels, but I want I, as a rogue, I don't want to be anybody's focus. Yeah, I I think ninety nine percent of the meat of this text is the last two sentences, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the first two that tell give you the last two, which is you have the ability to charm creatures at will. That's yeah. neat. It gives you advantage on charisma persuasion checks or charisma checks on your own. Basically, the help action does kind of mitigate a need for the being charmed in such a fashion, uh, and it won't get angry and hostile to the point where it'll attack you. Unless you like, so if you can offend it, you can call it some other names. As long as you don't do anything harmful to it, it won't be able to physically assault you. So I guess that might be for some people that play this game. I don't know. Um, but like, this is barely a feature. This is, um, mm. I think, the best they get so far, which is not good. I, you're probably right. Um, I, I, I want to like Rakish Audacity better, but. Yeah, infinite charm person is probably better. Yeah, loosely infinite charm person. Yeah. Uh, we also get elegant maneuver at level 13. So starting at 13th, you can use a bonus action on your turn to gain advantage on dexterity, acrobatics checks, or strength athletic checks you make during the same turn. That, that'll come into play every now and again. Yeah, probably. Uh, I doubt <laughs> you're the one making the athletics checks for the party. Which means this is well, just acrobatics checks for the most part. Like, normally yeah. your barbarian or your fighter or your paladin or your ranger or one of the stronger members of your party is going to be responsible for this. Bob, what's your regular strength on rogue? And is it higher than 10? Probably not. Is it normally 8? Acrobatics. I'm swinging that... in on chandeliers. Yeah. All the time. Were you failing those checks anyway? Like, if you wanted to do this, you could just stick your expertise in that. And then you probably don't need this. Like, what's a what's an important and high DC acrobatics check? Hmm. Juggling while tightrope walking. <laughs> Are you doing that often? All the time. Yeah. All right. Then on that character, <laughs> elegant maneuver is great. On everyone else, I will genuinely be surprised if you use it more than five times in a game. Through the entire okay, campaign. Yeah, I'm not not more super excited times. about this not one. Not going to happen. Yeah, uh, this is another trash tier feature. And we end on Master Duelist. Um, I will I will give it the small amount of credit. Um, that is the breaking grapples. Outside of breaking grapples, what I'm thinking of when I think of dexterity uh, acrobatics. But notably, you're reading your bonus action to do that, which kind of sucks because you can't disengage for free. So there is a little bit of tension there. But it makes you slightly better at bringing free of grapples. And that's the bulk of the text of the feature. That's important. I know I was getting comments about it if I didn't say that. I still don't like to comment <laughs> about it. Uh, anyway, we end on Master Duelist. I guess we're going to Yu-Gi-Oh! now. Uh, beginning at 17th level, your Mastery of the Blade lets you turn failure into success in combat. If you miss with an attack roll, you can roll it again with advantage. Once you do so, you can't use it for sure again. So you finish a shorter <laughs> long rest. Oh, that swing uh, really took it out of me. Yeah, that last... Like, maybe it was going to be kind of almost a 17th level. Oh, no, you can only use it once? Never mind. <laughs> Make it count. So I I don't know. Let's uh, do a retrospective, Bob. Uh, having gone through it with me today, are you still suckered into playing it? No, probably not. I 
Can I we put learned. this on a level this... higher than the duty tiers that we put the other two? Oh, oh, it's definitely getting a D. I'm not giving this an F. I'm not putting this in the same the same level as Inquisitive and Mastermind. This is it. Even if it deserves it, no, because this I think it deserves I still, it. I can believe I can believe I can trick myself into having fun with this. I I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people are playing base rogue and they're doing cool pirate things, and it has nothing to do with the subclass. <laughs> like just still nothing to do with what's presented here. Like they're they're buckling in and playing with their teammates, throwing sand in people's faces, and you know being a dirty scoundrel, and that's just a thing all rogues can do. Um, but they're doing it with a scimitar, so they feel piratey, and they never get any benefit from a single ability on this on this. On there this was thing. there was a comment on our mastermind video, um, where yeah, somebody was saying just that sort of thing. They're saying like, oh, a guy in my group is playing a mastermind right now, and he's doing this, and he's doing that, and he's having a lot of fun. And I was thinking, none of that requires the features of the mastermind of subclass. None whatsoever. Yes. Just be an arcane trickster and call yourself a mastermind <laughs> at that point, right? Subclasses yeah. are supposed to service the fantasy. They're supposed to be the on-ramp to doing and empowering people to do the cool things that the fantasy is supposed to work with, right? Things that we really, like, we rave about tend to be options that provide tools that characters otherwise don't have to live their archetype fantasy. Like, Fathomless is an example I'm going to keep popping back to, right? If you want to be a conjurer of tentacly deep monsters, it gives you a robust suite of ways to use those tentacles in cool ways that makes you feel like you're controlling a kraken, to make it feel like you're embodying this devotee of an ancient, big, uh, tentacled monster, right? I'd expect swashbucklers to get the more access to tools to do things like dirty fighting, to do things mm. like making using cannons, pulling out a pistol, right? I would expect them to have maybe a parrot familiar or something, right? We did a, a video that was talking about um, third-party content. One of my favorite third-party options of all time there is a swashbuckler redux that the Walrock homebrew made a while ago that gives you a parrot familiar. It's really clever and cute and does a lot of heavy lifting to make this option actually gain powerful features that make you feel like you're doing new pirate things that this option sure doesn't let you do. We need options to not scam people. And the most of the rogue archetypes scam you by promising you fantasies that give you no meaningful means of satisfying on their own, at least without you figuring out ways that any other character could have to live your own fantasy. All right. Yes, you're right. However, unlike some of the other subclasses we've discussed, I feel like this one's trying. All of these features relate in some way to being this master duelist, even if they're ultimately not successful or useful. For that, I'm giving it a D minus. <laughs> Give me this an F. Okay, that's because fine. Because it deserves an F. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm close to an F plus, but uh, do that. I'd feel better if you gave it an F plus. I'm not gonna lie. I think D's need to have at least one serviceable feature, and I don't think this meets that bar. Oh, all right. By that standard, all right, F plus it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, that was <laughs> Swashbuckler. We want to love you, Swashbuckler. We really do. Why I do know. You make I it so hard. I, whenever this game first came out, I was like, wow, who would ever play a thief? And then I saw all the, re the remaining subclasses get released, and thief starts to look pretty good when you compare it to the trash <laughs> that was released after it. Oh, all right. Uh, well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Let us know what you think about Swashbuckler down in the comments below. Like, subscribe. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.